Once again, Robert Nauer, unfiltered. I was a contracting officer, certified professional contract manager, certified public purchasing official, professor of government contracts, worked my way up from the bottom to the top of government, and I've seen a lot of shit in my days, let me tell you what. I've seen a lot of shit. Uh, but I didn't put up with shit. I was what another doctor who I worked with at ESGR once said was, Bob is the kind of guy that does not suffer fools very well. And I thought to myself, that's me. I don't suffer fools well. In other words, I don't put up with crap. One of the contracts that I had awarded when I was at the Department of Transportation, just before I retired from the federal government and started my own firm, uh, was a contract with an IT firm. Uh, it was an Indian IT firm, and I don't mean uh, American Indian, I mean a Indian firm from India that was naturalized Americans, but they only hired generally um, males and generally only Indian males. Though the company in question, I'm not going to use their name because I don't want to get involved in any of that, but um, the company only had one female in it at the time, and that was the wife of the owner or the CEO of the IT firm. And they their offices were located at Law and Font Plaza in Washington, D.C. And if you know where Law and Font Plaza is, it's right next to the Department of Energy. And at the time, it was right across the street from the depart the old Department of Transportation where I worked. Now the Department of Transportation is located over by the Navy Yard in a much more modern building. The contract that I awarded was an IDIQ, Indefinite Delivery and Definite Quantity Contract for Services with this IT firm to do certain specific work for DOT, for the Secretary's Office. And things were going fine. Um, a a person we knew by the name of Ann Benson, a person that I highly admire. She's a very good person, very top-notch program manager. She was the one who had persuaded this firm to bid on our IDIQ contract and submitted her proposal, which we ended up accepting. And we granted her the contract, granted the company the contract with her as the head of this program. And she had gone out and hired predominantly f white females. There was, I believe, one Indian female. But she hired predominantly white females to work with her on this particular DOT contract. Well, that did not sit very well with the Indian firm and with the owner of the firm because if you know anything about Indian firms, it doesn't matter whether it's there or here, women are second-class citizens in terms of working for Indian males. It's a cultural thing. It shouldn't be, but it is. Yes, they still have a caste system in India. And any country that still possesses a caste system is a totally fucked up country, let me tell you what. So the work was going on fine. For about the first half of the year that the contract was ongoing, the deliverables were delivered, payments were made, everything was hunky-dory. And work was going so well that we expanded the contract and gave them more work to do. Then, all of a sudden, uh, several months later, deliverables started to not show up on time. Work tended to slow down. And I started to field phone calls from 
some of the female employees working for our contractor. And again, I'm not going to mention the name of the contractor. Um, the only one I'll tell is Ann Benson, who was our direct representative with this firm. And we had no problems with her. And I received this information from some of the female employees of Ann's firm that they were being harassed, mistreated, harangued by the owner of the company, and threatened. And that whenever they would come over to our offices, uh, they were treated as if they were going to the bathroom. The owner of the company wanted to know the minute they left the company at Law and Font Plaza till the minute that they got into DOT, till the minute they met with me, till the minute that they did their work and when they were coming back. But here's the rub. It's called discrimination. He never did that with any of his male Indian employees. He never demanded to know their whereabouts, but he always demanded to know the immediate whereabouts of any female employee. In other words, he made life very stressful and very difficult for the female employees working for Ann Benson to do their job. And as a result, they all started to jump ship and look for other contractors to go to work for because they could not take the stress or the mistreatment by the owner of this firm and his wife. And of course, his wife, the only other real Indian female employee in the firm, uh, she sided with her husband, of course. So my, my boss and I talked about it, and we said, let's just let it play out for a week or two and see how things go. Well, that was a wrong decision because uh, things kept getting worse. And then deliverables didn't happen, and then we found out that most of the female employees of Ann's firm were going to jump ship. And I received one phone call that said, and I'm not going to mention this girl's name, she said, Bob, she goes, the owner of the company is threatening me with a lawsuit for violating my non-compete clause. And I said, well, did you sign a non-compete clause? And she goes, I did to not go to work, but she goes, I'm not going to work for a contractor. I'm coming to work for the government, the federal government. I go, he can't enforce that. That's an illegal, an, an illegal clause, an illegal enforcement action. He could enforce it if you were going to go to work for a competing contractor, but he cannot stop you from going to work for the federal government. And she was unaware that he couldn't do that. And I said, so I said, what you need to do is you need to go get a lawyer and turn around and um, if he does sue you, counter sue him because you will win and then you can win damages against this discriminatory boss of yours. So I went in and I talked to my boss about it at the time, a guy by the name of Thomas Kaplan, good guy. And um, I decided that I would call both the owner of the company, and their chief operations officer over to my office to talk to them about what they were doing to their employees and how it was impacting our federal contract work. My boss and I, we called them Mutt and Jeff. So I stood in my office. I made a phone call over to the owner of the company and the CEO and the chief operating officer, and I said the following. I said, hey there. This is Mr. Nauer. You know who I am. I'm the contracting guy at DOT. I want you and your chief operating officer over in my office in about five minutes. And I said, and we're going to talk about all the shit that you're pulling, causing an impact on our government contract work. So I said, get your ass over here to my office and get it over here now. And, and I said a few other things. And I, and I often tended to curse when I was really pissed. So I stood in my office with my boss using a pair of binoculars, and I watched Mutt and Jeff stumble out of their office very fast, trying to walk as fast as they possibly could, 
down the steps of the Law and Font Plaza, across the street, and over to the Department of Transportation. And and the one guy, the chief operating officer, who was a former Navy commander, he had a really bad leg and a, and a gimp foot. And he was tripping and falling the entire way, trying to keep up with the CEO. And we were kind of laughing about this. Go, look at them. Look at them stumble as they're trying to run over here. By the time they got up to the office, up the elevators to our, I think we were on the fourth floor, uh, they were out of breath. Uh, there, and it was the heat of the summertime in August. And you know August in Washington, D.C. is humid as hell and 100% humidity. So their shirts, their jackets were literally soaked through. Um, if he didn't have a, a T-shirt on, you'd have seen his nipples. Uh, it was They were just out of breath and panting when they got to our office. And uh, they came in, and they started to sit down. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't ask you to sit down. You're going to stand up. What I have to say to you two can be said with you standing up, because you're not going to be here long enough to sit down. And at that point, I read them the riot act. I said, you have been endangering the performance of our contract by your illicit and and immoral behavior. You have been mistreating your female employees, which is a federal violation. You are not providing equality with your employees. You're treating women one way and men the other way. And you are therefore causing your employees to quit and leave. And I said, and you know goddamn well what I'm talking about. I said, you have threatened your employees on the telephone with lawsuits that are leaving you because of your bad behavior and your discriminatory practices. And I said, and it is going to goddamn well stop right here and now. Because I said, as of today, I said, if you didn't know that I can do it, I am going to terminate your contract for default. And I said, and you do not want me to terminate your contract for default because you know that you will be subject to damages. You will be have to have you you will have to eat the cost of any other contract I get to replace you. You are going to lose money, so you do not want to piss me off. So I said, you have Ten days from today, from this meeting with me, and I handed them the termination for default notice called a cure notice. And I said, you have ten days to cure all of your ills on this contract, or I am going to terminate your fucking contract for default. And I said, and I don't fuck around, buddy. So I said, get your asses out of here. You go try to make everything right. You fix the problems that you have or your fucking contract is terminated in 10 days. I said, you have pissed off the wrong person. And you never saw, and my boss was standing there while I said all this, and he was kind of chuckling to himself. You never saw two old men, and I'm saying old men, I was young, I was in my 50s at the time. Um, they were in their early 60s at the time. You never saw two old men with that looked like white sheets. They had just turned pale white when I told them that I was going to terminate their contract, and I told them to get the fuck out of my office. So they left. And I saw, we watched them, and I used our binoculars to watch them go back across the street. And as they left the Department of Transportation building, walking back to Leonfant Plaza, they were pointing figures, fingers at each other and yelling. And you could see them literally pointing fingers and yelling at each other, like, I told you not to do that. Well, Mr. Nauer, he is going to terminate our contract. And he told us... He is going to terminate it unless we fix the problem. But you can just kind of read their lips when they went back. So, so anyway, I got a call from Ann Benson. I said, man, I don't know what you did, Bob, but you scared the living shit out of the owner of the company. And uh, 
we'll just have to see how things go. And I think that was the precursor for Anne leaving and forming her own company called Lincoln Insight. And Anne, as I said, was a fabulous person, fabulous employee, great program manager, understands government contracting better than most people. I literally adored that woman as a contractor. Anne Benson, if, if you're hearing this, uh, I love you. you. You were always number one in my book. And to anybody out there that ever wants to hire a truly great consulting firm in Washington, D.C., you want to hire Lincoln Insight because Ann Benson and her firm, terrific. Um, she just, she's the epitome of perfection. And so this IT company run by Indens um, basically was what caused Ann to leave and go start her own company. And, you know, it's like I say in life, you know, you never know what's around the next corner until you try. Sometimes you make a mistake, sometimes you don't. But I think it worked out for everybody. And um, that company, the IT company, yeah, they still do business with some government agencies like the FAA. Uh, if I was still in government, I'd probably never hire them. But um, you just, as a contracting specialist, as a contracting officer, you really need to not only have your ear to the ground, but you really need to take action. And to anybody who thinks that you can't terminate a federal contract for cause, you can. And, uh, and I did. So, just like people think that you can't fire government employees, I fired probably close to 180 federal employees in my total time in federal service. Uh, now, they were lower-level employees. The higher up the food chain you go, the harder it gets. But, you know, I fired everybody from uh, taking bribes, and graft, and corruption to wrongdoing to simply dereliction of duty. All you have to do is document it, put it in their record, and give them bad performance appraisals, and you can do it. And with government contractors, it really does kind of work the same way. It's called documentation, documentation, document. You document poor performance, and if it gets bad enough so that it's endangering government contract performance, you terminate their ass. And so that's what this story is all about, uh, and it just proves my point. Uh, know, know what's going on with your contracts and know who is working for you. Anyway, that's one of my other stories, a real life story, very true story. And uh, so with that, I'm going to say Bob out until the next episode.